If you get your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 20 as well. That's where we're going to be today. We'll have to keep looking up. We've got as many upstairs as there are downstairs, so I'll try not to forget you up there today. PP, uh, or Paul Dickinson has written a book uh, called Names, and I'm told he's got a hobby of collecting strange and unusual names. And he says that sometimes strange, uh, names can actually be uh, prophetic in nature. So he says, for example, in 1941, there were two men who were executed in the electric chair in Florida. Their names were Will Byrne and Will Frizzle. Uh, there was a window washer in Montreal who fell while he was washing windows and died. His name was Will Drop. Um, others, he said, seemed destined for certain occupations. Dan Druff became a barber. Uh, Jeff Treadwell became a podiatrist. Uh, Go forth and catch him. Can you imagine? Those guys became police partners. Um, O'Neill and Prey, well, they became partners in church equipment. Zoltan Overy became a gynecologist. A plaster contractor was named was, uh, Will Crumble. And my favorite, P.P. Peters, became a urologist. <laughs> and so there you go. Now, maybe you've never considered how prophetic a, a names can be in nature, but I think that most of us realize that a name is something more than just something that's on our birth certificate. Uh, our names express our identity. Our names have powerful associations. I bet that some of you were like Jenny and I whenever we were selecting names for our children. Um, I remember consulting the top 100 names of a particular year to see kind of what was the, you know, the the most popular names of that year. We, um, we, we talked about family associations and biblical, uh, you know, meanings and, and all of that. But inevitably, almost the same thing would almost always happen. I would like a name or she would like a name. And almost always, uh, one of us would object because we knew somebody who had that name, right? I mean, were you there? You're like, I don't want my child to have that name because they might grow up and be like him, or they might grow up and be like her, right? Now, that's dumb, but, but it shows that names matter. On, on paper, they're just maybe lines, or, but in life, they're much, much more. We associate them with character. That's why so few parents name their children Judas or Jezebel or Lucifer, right? I actually read this week as I was researching for this that the name Lucifer, parents are actually beginning to use this name for their kids. Are you kid Listen, you can name a cat Lucifer, but not a kid, all right? <laughs> Don't do that. I, all right, sorry, cat lovers. I, I, but this morning, this morning, we're coming to the third commandment in our Ten Commandments series. And the first commandment was no other gods before me. The second commandment was no images or idols. The third commandment has everything to do with a name. It has everything to do with the name, and specifically it has everything to do with the name of God. Look at, look at uh, Exodus chapter 20, beginning of verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, also include the King James Version up there on the screen. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That's the way that most of us remember this third commandment. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. And I think that for many of us, this is similar to last week because we think, well, this one really doesn't apply to me, right? I mean, I know what this command means. Mama told me since I was little, don't take the Lord's name in vain. And and yeah, there was that one time but that she heard, but that was, you know, that was the last time. And I've got this, right? This is not, this is not something I'm, I'm worried about. But this command is much larger than just pro, simply prohibiting people from calling God's name when they hit uh, their thumb with a hammer. We'll see that profanity is part of it, but taking God's name in vain or to misuse God's name means much, much more. Uh, take a look at your Bibles. Look at verse 2 and verse 5 and again in verse 7. You see the word LORD in all capital letters in, in those, those verses there? It, it, it's referencing the name of God that God first gave Moses. And scholars debate this some, but as a general rule, this is pretty well uh, considered that, that this would be the name that you and I would pronounce as Yahweh. But ancient Hebrew only had consonants. There were no vowels. And so 
it would actually look like this. It would just be four letters. Y-H-W-H. And Yahweh. Yahweh means I am, or I am who I am. Remember when God t tells Moses, hey, I'm gonna, I need you to go to Egypt. I'm going to use you to, uh, you're going to uh, help the, my, the, my people to be set free from slavery. And Moses is a little reluctant. He says, God, I, I don't know. What, I, what if they don't, what if they ask who's sending me? Who should I say? And God says, I am who I am. Tell them that Yah God reveals here that his name is Yahweh. And so if we were to read this third commandment in Hebrew, it would look a little bit closer to this. This would not be exact, but it would look a little bit closer like this. Never use the name of Yahweh, your Elohim, carelessly. Elohim refers to the supreme and faithful God. Yahweh will make sure that anyone who carelessly uses his name will be punished. And for the Jews, the name of God was so sacred. They wouldn't utter it. They wouldn't utter it out of fear that they would break this third commandment. They'd utter it out of fear that, that, that they would be punished for this. And when, when they read Scripture out loud, and when they came to, to the name of Yahweh, which is used over 6,500 times in Scripture, they would substitute it. They would say, Adonai, which means Lord. Now, scribes, on the other hand, whose job was to, was to copy the Scriptures, they would have no choice but to write this out, but they would do so reluctantly. I read this week that sometimes scribes would actually take a bath or they would use a new pen before writing out the letters Y-H-W-H. The name of God was so reverent. It was so holy to them. In fact, God's name, as you know, was only spoken one time a year. And it was by the high priest. It was on the Day of Atonement. And so perhaps the high priest would enter into the tabernacle, into the most holy place, and would get down on his knees and would say, Oh, Yahweh, would you forgive me of my sins and forgive the sins of of my people. Now, if the Jews who first received this command were so cautious about misusing God's name, doesn't it make sense that we should too? Of course it does. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment and how we need to do so. But at the same time, God didn't say, never use my name. He just said, don't misuse my name. He didn't say, don't, don't, don't ever use it, just don't misuse it. And I think this is a key distinction that we need to make this morning. It isn't that we can't use God's name, it's that we should never misuse God's name. Or that we should never take it in vain. And so what are some ways that we misuse or dishonor God's name? Well, I think there's several. Let me give you some examples that, that I thought about this week. The first one I think that comes to mind is always the one that we, that we recognize first is that we should never dishonor God's name in a profane manner. In a profane manner. Now, I don't want to be offensive here, but I think it's as necessary for me to give you an example um, just to sort of drive this point home just a little bit as it pertains to using God's name. Um, how many times have you ever heard a person who gets some startling news and they respond by saying, Oh my God! You heard, right? Or, or this day that we, the, this, this day and age that we live in, and you get a text message, and you respond back, OMG. Or maybe you're cut off in traffic, and you're a little bit aggravated, and you're annoyed, and you respond, Jesus Christ, watch where you're going. Right? Do you know what that says to me when we use God's name like this? First, it tells me that if you're a Christian, and you speak like this, that you're either uninformed or you're immature. Or, or maybe both, because when we talk like this, we're violating the third commandment. We're, we're, we're dishonoring God's name. Now, some of you might think, well, look, that's just the way I've always talked. I just grew up like this. This is, just, this is just sort of the way I talk. This is kind of the language I use. I can't really help it. <laughs> really? I mean, do you talk like that in front of your mama? Right? I mean, do you talk like that in, in, in church? No, I, listen, I don't buy it. I don't buy it when people say, this is just my language and I can't help it. Listen, I can't tell you how many times I've been part of a conversation where someone I just meet and I don't know them and their language is really, really colorful. I don't say anything because I know what's always coming next. They're going to always ask, they're going to say, hey, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I say, I, I'm a minister. And it's all, and their language changes completely. It's a miracle. I mean, it's a miracle. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. Look, so don't tell me that you can't change. Listen, if you're a Christian and you're still talking like that, it reveals a basic spiritual problem. Jesus said, 
in Matthew 12, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. When we give our life to Christ, we surrender everything to Him, including our language. Including our language. Freddie said, not 99%. We, we, we give Him all. If you're a Christian and talking like that, you're either uninformed or immature. But secondly, and maybe more importantly, it reveals that you don't fear God. Do you fear God? Do you fear God? Listen, this is just my advice to you, okay? You can take it or leave it. I'm just going to give this, throw this out here to you this morning. But if you choose to use words that where we would commonly refer to them as profanity or, or curse words in your vocabulary, I would make sure that I'm not attaching God's name to any of it. I, I, just, I just wouldn't. Proverbs 9 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We need to be reminded that God needs to be feared. And so we dishonor God's name when we use it in an insulting or profane manner. Another way we misuse or dishonor God's name is by ascribing something to His name when we shouldn't have. When we ascribe something to His name that we shouldn't have. I remember when Hurricane Katrina hit several years ago now that some preachers said um, that this must have been God's judgment against the wickedness that goes on in that city. Now, preachers should be able to stand up and preach against wickedness and call people to repentance. That's why, that's why Jonah, God called Jonah to the, to the evil city of, of Nineveh. And sometimes, church, the most loving thing that you and I can do is to tell people that you need to repent, that you need to change. You're on a crash course with the wrath of God. But if you're going to attach God's name to a tragedy where lives are lost and houses are destroyed and people are injured, you better be able to back it up. You've got to be able to back it up. One of, the, one of the cries in the Old Testament, the prophets were against people who claimed to be delivering messages from God who had really received none. You know, that's why as a church, we're committed that, that God's Word is our source of authority. And I, um, when I preach, typically, I, I, I preach expository. You know this by now. I, uh, most of the time, I, I'm, I'm just preaching right from the Word. I, I don't want to give you my opinion or my uh, suggestion on anything. I mean, I'll give you that some. But, but by, and, by and large, it's God's Word is our source of authority. Or, you know, so, so uh, just the opposite is true, though, sometimes. So, so we use, we ascribe something to God when we shouldn't have, but sometimes we, we don't ascribe something to God when we should have. Have you ever noticed this? Someone's healed from an illness, and we say, well, the doctors and, and the hospital workers were so good. Or we get in a promotion at work, and we say, yeah, I've worked so hard for this. It's been years coming, but I'm just so, I'm just so proud. Or a church begins to grow and the preacher proudly stands up and says, we've implemented some important changes to, uh, to, to, you know, to make things grow. And listen, all those things may be true. And there's nothing wrong with admiring doctors or being proud of your hard work or making necessary changes to help a church grow. But don't forget where the ultimate glory comes from. The ultimate glory goes to God. Nothing good happens in our life without God doing it. Right? Nothing good. So, so, don't forget, it's His name that deserves chief honor. Psalm 29, 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory to His name. Worship the splendor of His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. You know, another way we can misuse God's name is through false teaching. It's through false teaching. Did you know that preachers and teachers are warned that we'll be judged more harshly than other believers? James 3, 1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. It makes you kind of uh, take a second uh, thought about teaching that third grade Sunday school class, right? You know, I, I, look, I'm going to have a hard enough time getting to heaven as it is. I don't need any more scrutiny on me, right? No, no I, that's not what James is implying here. Listen, God, the, the, the point is God cares about his name. He cares about his name, and teachers are responsible for shaping that image and how people think about him and how will, they will receive him. There's countless ways that we could talk about how we dishonor God's name. We dishonor when we use it for self-promotion. When we use God's name for, for me, we dishonor God's name when we use it for evil. We see this in our world today with terrorism. We dishonor God's name when we use it as monetary gain. Just for me, you know, I attend church or I do this because it's good for my business. Listen, there's all kinds of ways that we can dishonor God's name. But verse 7 reminds us this morning not to do so. It says, the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. 
And so for, this, for some of you this morning, this is a much needed reminder that God's not going to allow his name to be slandered. And that for you and I, we need to hold up his name to the most, to the most high. And so the question becomes then is how can we do that? How can we best honor the name of God? And there are literally so many ways that we could talk about here this morning, but let me give you a few. The first one, one of the best ways to honor God's name is by watching our lives closely for hypocrisy. It's watching our lives closely for hypocrisy. Um, I noticed on, uh, I do Facebook every once in a while, I'll get on, and I'm not on that much, um, but I'll, I'll get on it, and I noticed that one of the girls um, that was... Um, in my youth group, when I was in Kentucky, she was just a little bitty thing. Uh, she got married like a week or two ago. It made me feel old, and, you know, that that, that was happening. But, but she, there were some pictures there of her and her new family, and she said, oh, I just love my new last name. Now, can you imagine a scenario where a new bride gets married, and she, they, they have a reception at, at the church, and, and then after the reception, she immediately goes back and starts living like she did when she was single. You know, after the, the wedding, the reception, she gets in the car and she drives. She's getting ready to go off. And her husband says, well, where are you going? She said, well, I, I'm going home. He said, what do you mean I'm going home? She said, I, I'm going home. I, I'll see you later on. We'll, we'll talk ever, ever now and then. I'll, I'll holler at you if I need something. I mean, that, that would, that would, and she just goes back and living like she did when, when she was, before she was married. That would be ridiculous, right? I mean, no, no bride, no groom, rather, would stand for that. But I fear that that's what so many of us do. We receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. God gives us a new name. When that happens, God gives you a new name. He gives you a new identity. Listen to what John says in John 1, 12. He says, To all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. You see where your new identity lies? You're a child of God. You're a child of God. And, and, yet you, and yet so many continue to misuse God's name by living like we did before our name was changed. I heard about a soldier who was uh, in the army of Alexander the Great. He had deserted his post in battle. And when the soldier was asked his name, the soldier studied in fear. He said, uh, uh, Alexander... Alexander, my Lord. And to which Alexander the Great said, Son, you got three choices. Fight, get out of the army, or change your name. And I wonder how often God says the same thing to us. Either change your name or start living in a way that's going to bring me glory. Either change your name or time to get out. Listen, another way we can honor God's name is by reserving certain words only for Him. Now, I have to tell you that this is not something I've ever done. This, is, this would be a new something for me as we sort of try to apply this message. But this week as I was thinking about this in God's name, I began to think about how, um, how I throw words around. Do you, do you do that? Do you sort of just throw words around like the words like awesome or amazing or glorious? Right? We sort of throw those words around, right? That, that game was awesome. Did you see how bad Kentucky beat Mississippi State? That game was awesome. <laughs> or that meal was amazing. Those hush puppies, they should be illegal. You know, my date was glorious. I mean, everything worked out perfect. She looked so pretty. But what if we reserved words, big, powerful words like that, only when we were talking about God? I mean, how would that maybe change the way we think? I mean, what if we, we only reference, you know, words like how awesome or how amazing or how glorious when we were thinking about Him? I think it's worth a try, don't you? I think it's worth a try. Now, listen, don't be legalistic about this. Don't be, you know, if, if, your, husband, if your husband tells you that you look amazing, look, take it as a compliment. Just go with it, all right? But, but what, just, let's, let's try to reserve certain words for only God, the most powerful and descriptive words when we're talking about Him in His name. You know, another way we can honor God's name is through worship each week. Did you realize, do you realize that what you're doing here this morning, it's honoring and pleases God? Did you realize that? Psalm 34, 1 says this, I'll install the Lord at all times. 
His praise will always be on my lips. I will glorify in Yahweh. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify Yahweh with me. Let us exalt His name together. Don't you just feel better after you've been to church and praise the name of God with other believers? Why don't you just feel better? There's just something about there's just something about singing and lifting up the name of God. There's just something about that name. In fact, I want us to do that together right now. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Sing this with me. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the after the rain. Lift it up to him. Jesus, 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 let all heaven. And earth proclaim kings and kingdoms about so we honor God every time we gather for worship. We lift up his name. Do you know how else we honor God's name? We honor God's name by receiving salvation. By receiving salvation. Scripture tells us that it's God's will that all men, all women come to a knowledge, come to a saving relationship with Him. Do you know that? That it's God's will for your life, for you to trust Him. And I can confidently look you in the, in the eye and say, look, if you've never taken the name of Jesus, it's not by my authority, it's by the Word of God. If you've never taken the name of Jesus today, you need to do that today. You need to do that today. Paul writes this in 1 Timothy 2. He says, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants some people to be saved. Not all people to be saved. And to come to a, a, to a knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself up as a ransom for all people. That's God's will for you. That's God's will for me. God came to, to Moses and said, My name is Yahweh. But to, and, and he revealed himself to Moses. But through time, God has revealed himself to us in an even greater way through the Son, through Jesus, through the name of Jesus. And that's the name that we call on for salvation. Jesus. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you call on His name like this, we, listen, we honor God when we do. We honor God when we do. Jesus gave Himself up for me. He gave Himself up for you. Scripture tells us that passage we just read, that He was our ransom. That He was our exchange. That He, that he paid the price. It's an incredible gift that God has given each of us, and it pleases Him when we choose salvation. Today, for some of you, the best way that you begin honoring God's name is by calling on the name of Jesus and by being obedient to Him in baptism. That's the best way that you can begin by honoring God today. And and I said to Saul after he'd become blind, he said, what are you waiting for? Get up! Be baptized and wash away your sins. How? Calling God on his name. Listen, there's power. There's power in his name. There's power in his name. And you know what happens when we receive Christ? This is so cool. You know what happens when we receive Christ? Something happens with our name. Our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Our, our, our name is written in God's book for all of eternity so that someday, someday when we come to meet him, that our grace that, that Jesus has given us because of that, that we will be able to, to live with him forever. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how different your life will be if you just made it your ambition every day that you were going to glorify, that you were going to honor God's name, that you weren't going to take it in vain, but you were going to, you were going to misuse it, but you were going to honor him. I think we'd be much more aware of, of our language. 
our speech, what comes out of our mouth, especially maybe in a profane way. I think we'd make sure that our, our, our walk is matching our talk, right? I think we'd steer conversations more towards Jesus if we were honoring God's name every single day. I think we'd make sure that God gets the glory. Everything good in our life, it's not just something that I've done or ultimately it's something that God's done. And another thing I think, I don't think we'd slander those who been, have been created in His image. This is, there's so many things. We would love all people. We would be different. We would be different. That's the people that God has called us to be. Merv Griffin once interviewed Charlton Heston about his experience in playing Moses in the movie The Ten Commandments. Griffin asked Charlton, has making a religious movie impacted your spiritual outlook? Heston looked at Griffin and replied, he said, you can't walk barefoot down Mount Sinai and be the same person as you were when you went up. God wants us to use his name. It's not in vain. God wants us to be changed people. And that's what he's called you and I to be. Do you know that, every, that one day, every knee is going to bow at the name of Jesus? Do you know that? One day, listen, you may want to choose to dishonor him now. You may want to choose. You can do whatever you want. But one day, one day, you're going to honor him. You're going to honor him. Every day, one day, every knee is going to bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue is going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, all to the glory of God the Father. Let's do that today. Let's praise God today. Let's live like that every single day. Let's honor Him now, and we'll honor Him in a greater way even when He comes. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, I, my prayer today is that we would honor Your name in all that we say and all that we do. And God, I pray if there's any here today that need to, to honor you by taking that first step and just receiving salvation, that you give them the confidence and the courage to do so. Father, thank you for loving us so much to send Jesus to be our ransom, to be our payment, and Father, to, uh, to pave a way for my salvation, for my life on earth as it is or as it will be in heaven someday. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we ask these things in Christ's name.